at this point of time, before uh, Mr. Kakama starts, any question or any clarification from the participants in this session? Very good. Thank you very much, and over to you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, very pleased to be in Tbilisi and to participate in this important uh, conference on legal aid. And even more important because we are like talking and focusing on legal aid for children. So I will start my presentation by providing just briefly the context in terms of the way the guidelines were developed and where we are coming from in developing the guidelines. We are aware that uh, one of the key obstacles to children is equitable access to justice with lack of specialized child friendly including legal and assistance. And we are also aware that most children who are in contact with the law find the actual experience of legal proceedings confusing and at best a source of fear, distress, and sometimes leading to secondary victimization. Even when we are or they do very little to support children to participate in proceedings in a safe, meaningful, and dignified manner. Access to experts, specialized and trusted legal practitioners is definitely an important building block for a child-friendly justice system. And within our region, our region being Europe and Central Asia, and perhaps other parts so who are our target group? Who are these guidelines targeting? They are targeting uh, government-funded and private lawyers. They are targeting paralegals and other legal practitioners who provide legal aid to children in both civil, administrative, criminal, but also in restorative justice proceedings. So what do the guidelines focus on? They focus on increasing the attitudes, the knowledge, and the skills of the practitioners. The guidelines are also rooted in international and regional standards regarding children's access to justice. And they are also underpinned by the four core principles of the CRC, which we are all aware of, non-discrimination, best interests, survival and development, and the right to be heard. So these key principles traverse the entire guidelines and they are a core reference for each of the guidelines that we're going to be talking about shortly. So how are the guidelines structured? They are structured around the key themes and challenges that arise in providing child-friendly legal aid to children, ensuring Competence to act, acting in a child's best interests, communicating in a child-friendly way, facilitating a child's participation in legal proceedings, countering and preventing discrimination, keeping children safe and working with others. Although the guidelines cannot provide every situation or circumstance confronting the legal practitioners we believe that the guidelines are going to fill an important gap in terms of knowledge, skills, but also an attitudes. And so how are they developed? So UNICEF Central uh, Europe and Central Asia Regional Office, in collaboration with our country offices, worked with a network of legal practitioners in 12 different countries, including our host, Georgia, here. So the legal practitioners, we are sent a questionnaire, first and foremost, to understand what are the issues, what are the challenges, but also what are the good practices. So the information that was gathered was incorporated into the development of the guidelines. So we didn't just simply sit in Geneva and develop them. We took into account the practical issues that legal practitioners are facing and were able to be taken into account in having these guidelines in place. 
So just like to be clear about the terminology, within the guidelines, the terminology used is explained. But I just wanted to focus your attention on how we define legal pra professional or practitioner in the context of these guidelines, but also legal aid. So in the context of these uh, guidelines, a legal professional or practitioner is any person qualified and entitled in national law to provide legal device assistance and representation. But legal aid also encompasses legal advice, assistance, and representation of children. So the focus is not just about the technical professional lawyers, but everybody who provides some support and assistance children when they are in the justice system for whatever reason. So when we are talking about practitioners, that is really the sense that is understanding. So the guidelines in a nutshell, we have got like 12 guidelines. The first guideline is about the competence when providing legal aid to children, emphasizing the relevance of knowledge of domestic law and procedures, and procedures children's rights, children's developmental stages, and how to communicate with children. So the, uh, when you look at the guidance, you get a bit of detail there. And the guide number two is acting in the child's best interests. The best interests of the child should be a primary consideration in all actions taken when children are in contact with the law. Legal professionals must be aware of this obligation and should comply with it in evaluating and acting in the best interests of their child clients. Of course, there is no definitive list of factors to take into account when evaluating the best interests of a child. Such a list would definitely be impossible to produce since the individual circumstances of a child will always be different case by case. But the principle is that in whatever case, in whatever manifestation, the best interest of uh, the child should be given due consideration and is paramount. Guidance three is about effective participation. Active participation of children in their cases can be very beneficial for them, but can also be beneficial for the legal process. For example, if we look at child victims and witnesses, having their opinions heard and taken into account can help them to recover, it can build their self-confidence, and can also help them to better understand their skills and potential. For child offenders, the right to participate can help them to develop a sense of responsibility and can help in their rehabilitation and reintegration. But we are also looking at building a relationship. You cannot work with somebody with whom you don't have a relationship. It goes without saying. But even for children, a legal practitioner should be able to build a conducive, favorable relationship with the child for the child to be able to open to him or to her and for the legal practitioner to understand the children's needs and be able to represent the child effectively. Guideline five is about child-sensitive communication, and guideline six is about providing reliable and relevant information. Children cannot participate in meaningful proceedings unless legal practitioners communicate with them in a child-sensitive manner. Similarly, legal professionals or legal practitioners must provide children with reliable and relevant information so that they can participate meaningfully in decision making. Of course, the guidelines provide a little bit more details on how you can communicate with children. What considerations do you need to uh, take into consideration? How do you make sure that the communication is effective? Because sometimes we can talk with children, but we are probably not communicating. We are simply talking to them, but they are, they are not understanding what we are saying as practitioners. And as practitioners, we are also not understanding what the children are saying. So child-sensitive communication and ensuring that our children are provided with reliable and relevant information. Guideline number seven is about effective participation uh, in formal proceedings. 
Legal practitioners must ensure that children participate in formal legal proceedings in a meaningful and in a safe way, with adequate support and procedural safeguards in place. A child cannot be heard effectively where the environment is intimidating, like as we know, the court systems are intimidating to children, and often they are insensitive or inappropriate for the child's age. And like guideline number eight is working with the family members and other supportive adults. While the legal practitioner is actually working directly with the child and providing uh, assistance to the child directly, or even representing the child directly, there are instances when the legal practitioner must also work with the family. But I think the principle is that in that case, the legal pro uh, practitioner must be guided by the children's interests rather than the interests of the family. So that's something that you need really to take note of and bear it in mind as you directly work with the children. And the guideline nine is about privacy and confidentiality. Legal professionals should uphold the child's right to privacy during legal proceedings and ensure that all communication with the client, and the client in this case is a child, is kept confidential. And I think some of you are legal practitioners already know the value of confidentiality and the negative effect if the child's confidentiality is breached. But we're also aware that there are some instances where confidentiality might need to be put aside, especially if the circumstances are going to put the child's life in danger. So in that uh, perspective, you may have to take do away with confidentiality, but in most cases, you should keep confidentiality as much as possible. And guideline number 10 is about protecting children from discrimination. Must ensure that children are treated fairly and they are not discriminated against because of their age, gender, ethnicity, disability, or any other issue of difference. And I think the important point to note here is that our own biases and prejudices as practitioners should never, never be able to influence the kind of action and the response. So let's be aware of our own prejudices, let's manage them. And if we feel our prejudices are such strong because I don't believe in gender, or I believe this is just about a child, let them be kept away and don't allow my sentiments to interfere with the legal representation of the child. So the last two guidelines are about keeping children safe and working with others. We are aware in our day-to-day -day practice that when children come into the justice system, children may be exposed to other vices by virtue of entering the justice system. Therefore, as practitioners, we must be aware of the risks that children face when they come into the system. And therefore, we should be able to know what the risks are and be able to see how we can, yeah, how we can mitigate those risks. And by doing that, we need to work with others who are not uh, legal practitioners, maybe social workers, judges, and others, to be able to mitigate those kind of risks. And that also means that even if we are the ones representing the children directly, we should not undervalue the role and relevance of other professionals because the needs of children in the justice system cannot only be met by professional judges and lawyers, they also need to get the support and work with other professionals who have something to contribute to improving the situation of children. So just one reminder, and this is a one but last slide. The 12 guidelines that I've just talked about are not mutually exclusive. They are mutual and they reinforce each other. It is therefore imperative that practitioners have in place mechanisms that will allow them to apply all the elements of the guidelines in their work. So it is not about priority that I know one, 
I can put into practice one and not the other. That is not the issue. The issue is to see how they work and the guidelines can all be used to support the child in totality. And that link is where you can actually get the guidelines. So you can take note of it and you can actually go to the link and get the guidelines. So this is the last slide. We are talking about the guidelines. We don't want the guidelines to just be another piece of document to be put on the shelf. They should be operationalized. They should be used in our day-to-day -day practice, yeah. So what I've listed here are some of the suggestions that you can actually do and use in our day-to-day -day practice. And we are going to continue seeing how we can work with country offices to ensure that the guidelines are operationalized. So I'd like to end here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting presentation and thank you also for uh, keeping up with the time. Um, two, two main things I think Mr. Kakama revolved around. First thing is the best interest of the, of the child and how to maintain this at all levels, at all times, very important. And also, I think here, maybe in the questions also, we can discuss a little bit the capacity uh, development needed to make sure that stakeholders do understand how to apply and how to ensure the best interest of children, especially when they are in contact with the law. The, the, the other point is how to operationalize the guidelines. This is also very important because, I mean, unfortunately, many times we see very nice guidelines, but very different from the practice. And then the practice to happen, it needs a good inform enforcement mechanism and system, but also it needs a lot of change in the mentalities. Thank you very much again. And please note down your questions to uh, uh, the end of the session. Around 10 past 3, we will start the, the discussions. Except for Justice Renate Winter, the questions will follow the presentation. And I think uh, all of you know Justice Renate Winter, an international uh, figure advocate for children's rights. And uh, she is an Austrian lawyer who distinguished herself for her extensive career as a juvenile and family judge. She is a scholar and a public speaker, very influential public speaker, in fact. In May 2013, Justice Winter was appointed as a member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. In 2015, she became the vice president, whereas in 2017, she assumed the role of the president of the committee. In June 2002, Ms. Winter was appointed by the UN Secretary General to the Appeals Chamber of the Special Court of Sierra Leone. She was elected President of Special Court in May 2008, and since November 2013, Justice Winter is a member of the Residual Special Court. Uh, special Court. In November 2016, she became the President of the Special Court. In her various roles, Justice Winter has served as a strong supporter of child rights and child protection. And also, please allow me to say that Justice Winter is a remarkable supporter of UNICEF's humanitarian and development work across the world. The floor is yours, and thank you very much. We have had uh, now a, a theoretical basis of the most important things that we have to deal with when we speak about children and uh, the necessity for having a legal assistance for them. Now it's already rather difficult for a child, really rather difficult for a child, to be in front of the justice system and especially in front of a court, I am judge myself, uh, without any kind of assistance if this child was a perpetrator. But it's by far more difficult, by far more difficult, to be in front of a court being a victim or a witness without any kind of legal assistance. Uh, I'm going to give you, before we speak again about uh, theoretical basis and so on, uh, I'm speaking about uh, justice in matters involving child victims and witnesses. This is another 
book that a booklet that has been uh, developed uh, by UNICEF together with uh, UNODC. I have here a version. I will leave it then, uh, maybe with the honor. Uh, if anyone is interested, this is not the version of the guidelines. This is the version for children on, for concerning the guidelines. And that might be especially interesting for some of you because uh, the younger the child victim or witness, the more difficult it is for the child victim and witness to stand alone in front of uh, the court. Imagine you yourself when you have been, I don't know, eight years, nine years old, and then you go alone into a hospital knowing that you will be operated. Would you feel comfortable? Mostly not. The same goes for children and the justice system. And uh, first of all, I would like to give you an example so that we can measure then the uh, guidelines against our example. And this example that I'm giving you is a real one. It was a real case. A 16-year-old girl was raped by eight men. Uh, I can say that she was raped because finally the men were, uh, uh, were, were condemned and quite heavily so. She was, uh, first of all, interrogated by the police. Afterwards, she was uh, alone, because in her country, uh, children had uh, child victims and witnesses do not have the right to have a lawyer. Also not a legal aid lawyer, no lawyer. And because she came from a very, uh, distressed, to say the least, family, her parents did not go with her either. So she was alone by the, with the police. Then afterwards, she was alone with the social services. Then afterwards, she was again alone uh, with the prosecution. And then finally, she was alone at court. And at court, she was alone standing there in front of the judge, the prosecutor, eight lawyers and eight uh, accused persons huh? alone. And the judge, a non-specialized penal judge, non-specialized for child issues, has allowed eight men and eight lawyers, 16 of them, to uh, cross-examine the girl. 16 men against this girl. It took three weeks, each day, three weeks. At the end of the uh, second week, the girl started to scream and to cry, and one of the lawyers said to, yeah, you see, Johanna, you see, she, now she's, she's done, now she broke, breaks down, now she's crying, now she's going to tell you that she lied all the time. And the judge did not intervene. And uh, the second lawyer asked, and the third lawyer asked, and they asked all the same questions. And the judge did not intervene. And then gave the judge the, the sorry? How old the girl? 16. Uh, after six, uh, eight lawyers, the judge gave the floor according to the law, to all, one after the other, of the eight uh, uh, accused persons, and all of them attacked the girl. Dirty slut, you wanted, you got what you wanted, you wanted to have money from us, and so on and so on. And the judge did not intervene. Finally, on the last day, uh, the parents of the girl came, and the father of the girl said, when, when, this, uh, when asked by the judge about the situation of the girl, he said, I am not sure what has happened and I rather would not intervene and I do not want to stay on the side of my daughter because I do not know exactly if the girl misbehaved, yes or not. It finally, the outcome, Evidence was enough, evidence was there. Uh, witnesses, other witnesses were heard, and only then, 
Only then, the judge uh, finally uh, relieved the girl and let her go after three weeks. And this is exactly why uh, we all, all of us who work for children, want that each and every member state of the United Nations, having ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, has to have legal aid, mandatory, free, for each and every child, victim, and witness. Even if the parents are there, because parents sometimes are not, helpfully, uh, not helpful. And e sometimes parents make the situation of a child even worse. And therefore, it is absolutely mandatory to have uh, uh, the possibility to ask for legal aid. This girl and the family of this girl that I have been speaking about would never, ever have had the money to ask for a lawyer or to pay for a lawyer. So, so far for, a practical, for the practical part. Now, let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, let's see what our guidelines say and what, uh, let's see what would have worked if that girl would have had a lawyer. Yeah? The right to be treated with dignity and compassion is the one of the rights we have been speaking about, the rights and the basic rights in, this, in the session just before. So I'm going to go into detail with those. Uh, the right to be treated with dignity and compassion. I do not have to say, oh, poor little one, oh, my poor little one, how is it with you? This is not compassion. But compassion would have been from the part of the judge to say, I'm sorry, but this kind of question is not allowed. It is, of course, the right of a lawyer to do whatever he can to break a vict victim or a witness that is testifying against his client or her client. This is his right. But it is not his right to uh, uh, to uh, uh, violate the dignity of a victim or witness. And if it is, is a child, then he has to find the possibility to show a little bit of understanding and compassion, as we have heard before. Uh, the right to be protected from discrimination, we have been speaking about that also before already. And there we have a special problem in quite a lot of countries. And you would not believe in how many countries with uh, protection against discrimination in cases of sexual violence. We have many, many countries where uh, a girl that is raped will be a victim of uh, the traditional beliefs of the country. And there again, we have uh, to have a person next to that child to make, uh, that, who makes sure that this girl is not being discriminated because something terrible has happened to her. Uh, the right to be informed. I have the, the need and the possibility to tell the child, the child victim or witness, who has never been most of the time in court, what is going to happen, why it is go going to happen, who is who, all this has to be told to her. And there is nobody who is going to tell the child if there is not legal aid for that child. The right to be heard, we have been speaking about it. If I do not ask a child, in a way that a child can understand and in a way that this child is respected, the child is not going to open up and is not going to collaborate, cannot. The right to effect effective assistance is exactly about what we are speaking. Effective assistance means legal assistance, first of all, in a private setting. It is not possible to have a victim or a witness waiting uh, somewhere where the, uh, uh, the aggressor uh, also, uh, also stays, lives, waits, whatever. Because then you immediately are going to have an attack. Immediately. And if we have uh, family issues, for instance, because there's violence in the family, and this is another big issue where we have discrimination and everything else. If we have this situation, then again, we cannot afford that the child is alone in the same room with the family of the, of the defendant. And there again, we need somebody to make sure that this girl is protected. Uh, 
Therefore, we speak also about the right to safety. I will give you a, a, a case again, and uh, I have two more minutes, I think, or three? Five, Five. good. Uh, Five minutes. Uh, yeah. yeah, because I mean, I'm not going to speak about all those rights, because everyone can read and write, no? Here, in the room. So uh, it's available. I just want to bring the, the issues. I, have, I, has, I myself have had a case in a country where the, the victims and witnesses were three girls. Uh, three girls trafficked and, of course, uh, sexually misused. We have, uh, uh, I invited them and I asked, uh, because there was no legal aid at the time and there was no lawyer at all at the time, and I asked the prosecutor to make sure that those girls uh, are in a separate house, held in a separate house, uh, where they could come from and go to when, uh, when uh, we, we needed them at trial. Prosecutor did it. At the end, I said to the prosecutor, so, and now I, we have to make sure that they come home safely. And come home safely would have been to cross the country and to go into another one. And the prosecutor said, why should I? Why should we? They have given their testimony. Our case is there. Our case is closed. It's fantastic. Now we do not need to care about them anymore. They are not good for justice at all anymore. We found those three girls half a year later when the ice on the mountains was melting. They were be below because they were trafficked, as I said. And traffickers are most of the time organized. And we know what organized crime means. And there is no way, no way to say, I have used somebody, a child, as a witness a victim I have used as a witness, and then I do not care anymore because my case is closed. Quite on the contrary, I have to give the information to a victim, child, and uh, his or her environment if I know already, or when I know already, that uh, the perpetrator, the one who has violated this child, will be set free. This is a duty. It is a duty. And if somebody tells you it's not a duty of the court because there, he might be free uh, in 20 years, in 15 years, it's not your case at all anymore. You know, maybe you are already dead. It is the duty of the justice system to keep that in an agenda and to notify if somebody uh, goes out. And it is the duty of the legal assistant, the legal aid person. They have an archive. They have to do that. They have not to forget about that. We have to, to tell the child about special preventive measures if they are necessary. Maybe you need an opaque shield. Uh, it's not a judge who thinks about it. He should or she should. Not always the case. It's not a prosecutor. He should, but it's not always the case. But the legal aid person has to. If nobody else is doing it, the legal uh, representative has to. This is his or her duty. He or her has to ask for special preventive measures if they are needed. And another issue that I do not have here now in the guidelines, uh, because I do not have time anymore, is the question of oath. When can I ask in a cross-examination, for instance, that a child has to give an oath, I swear by God. Yeah? Can I do that with an eight-year-old? Can I do that with a 10-year-old? No. I can do it only with a child that has already reached the age of criminal responsibility. And even then, I can not say, OK, you have now given an oath, and we uh, have proven you wrong, or we have proved, we have, could not prove that the person is guilty, therefore you must have lied, and therefore I'm going now to punish you for lying to the court. This is not possible. 
and it is not possible to ask for an oath for a child under the age of criminal responsibility. This is, in, this is against the law. Yeah. Because we cannot ask something from somebody who has not the majority to do, uh, to, to perform correctly. And once again, and this is my last thing, it is the issue for the legal aid person, and I'm speaking about legal aid and not about lawyer, because in most of the cases we need legal aid because the people in front of us are too poor. In many, many, many cases. So the, it's the legal lawyer when the, the, the prosecutor says okay, or when the, the, the defendant says okay, this child has now to give an oath, it is him to say no way, he's not going to give an oath. It is the duty of the judge then to say okay, uh, uh, okay, I'm going, I'm asking you now to tell the truth because if you don't do that, then you might bring somebody in disrepute, you might be a nuisance to somebody, you even might bring an uh, in uh, 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 innocent person into prison. That I can do, but I cannot ask for an oath. Concerning all the other issues, please have a look in the booklet. It is available, uh, I mean for adults, and it would be good for all those who are working with children to have the child version, because there you have everything explained in a child understandable language. And if you do not believe me, then please think about uh, if you would have a client, a four-year-old girl that has been raped by the father. So, and please think about how are you going to protect this child. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Winter, not only for a very touching presentation, but also for taking us into a reality journey because really, uh, at least myself, I felt that we are in front of real cases and which you bring from your extensive and long experience. And also allow me to mention that I have seen few cases where the legal aid was provided, but the lawyer is very young in the career and does not have a clue of what adolescent development, of what the, the, the Beijing rules or other red guidelines or whatever are, and then we end up sometimes in even worse situations. So legal aid provided, but also appropriate with qualified uh, lawyers. Again, thank you very much, uh, and as usual, very, very uh, uh, touching, and also from the field, and from the, from the heart, and from the brain. Thank you very much. Uh, I will open the floor now for questions for up to 10 minutes. Please let me know if you have any question or comment or you need any clarification. Yes, please. Uh, I shall speak in Arabic, please. Can you please introduce yourself? Yes. Yes, thank you. Yeah, you can speak in any language which is, uh, which is having translation. Uh, okay. It's me, Maysam al Nwayri. قاضية ومديرة عامة لوزارة العدل في لبنان. Is it okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. No? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I, I just want to uh, uh, tell you a small comment. Uh, you, you were, ah, English, okay, <laughs> in English. Uh, you were talking about the legal aid for the children. Uh, in Lebanon, we have the law, especially for children. Uh, we don't have the legal aid in Lebanon. But we have this special law, and in this special law, uh, all the children we have, for the older children, we have the judges specialized for the children, and uh, in the courts, and uh, from the beginning, for the children before coming to the court, they should have um, a social worker with them. It is in the law. So since they are in touch with the, uh, with the, 
uh, with a public uh, agent, you know, for a, a criminal public agent. Since the beginning, they should have a social worker with them, and the social work worker should accompany uh, the child all over the procedure till uh, the uh, till the trial uh, with the with the, uh, the judge specialized or children. Uh, but as you said, it is very much important that the, all the persons concerned with the children should have uh, a special training. And this is what we are doing, in spite of the fact that we don't have legal aid. And with the cooperation of UNICEF, that we thank very much, uh, we are making a training for the judges, um, especially for children, for the, for the social workers, for the lawyers, and uh, for the general prosecutors. This program has, is being implemented uh, now in Lebanon. Uh, that means that we are doing something like the legal aid, but in other form. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think there's no question, right? It was a comment. Thank you very much. Any other uh, comment or question? Yes, please go ahead. Talian <laughs> Samarlebi regulatsi arat asrikepsi mas da arg zalav spir da peri mishnobit rom juaradin da ke tuhi zarmoy bar shile bar asutomnis mimart. Tumsa amadulat chuen vitit rom juaradin da ke tuhi shile ba ikos da mazianne beli arasutomnis isromat shile ba zalian maune zegable na ikonios vine idan tavis shinar si juaradin da ke tuhi mizanim dgomari obsrom kharem gamoi kenos es resursi imisros miigos tuhi tuhi tavis tuhi sasurveli informatsia anu. Mots mis dabne wada sasurveli informatsi is migeva. Amma drula chuen guak paushvi sauket eso interesi cheshmarite interesi romlan sunda ikos amosawali zerteli. Tan amma drula dari sadu kati konge tul klienti saromad geeli. Rode sadsi iski tchaus dazar al buz dari spral de bulis saromad geeli. Ta propesi uli eti kis norme bi mas awal de buleps yrom daitsuas klienti sauket eso interesi bi ta kaket os kuda peri klienti stui sasurveli shedigis dasad gumat. Anu xirat eti ka anu ari sadu kati pshori sasta skuda skuda baro me chem klientan ma kar kolu awal de buleba eti ka ma awal de buleps rom kuda peri unde kaket os misi interesi bi dasad sawat. Amma drulat shedile ba interesi pshi kos juare din dagi tchui sakmo dagri si uli tsi tsar moi ba magram a ka amma drulat specializasi at skuda kusda ari sagi tchui ای جوارد این دقت خورم دینه دیک نبا باشی سوکت سو اینترنت سپشی. ای آم سعیت زد تا او پروتکل دلورد تو کنی شه خدول بادا تو آکس گایروز باشی سوپل بادا کمیت سرمه گذاشت خودت لبام زگابسی گذاشت خودت لبام میگه بولی. آن سر کمیتاسیون ناشر میروم لیشی لبام دو کتاب ما کاموی خنون پрактиکاشی اپکتورا. تا ایتالیان مادری رو ویک نبی تو آم است نگابشی بی تو پرو کنگر دلورد گوید بود. Thank you, please. <coughs> there is indeed, and <coughs> there is uh, also the, uh, quite a lot of, of uh, practice in this regard because <coughs> this is uh, a problem that you have everywhere. Now, uh, what uh, in many countries, uh, the solution that many countries found as concerning children is that the, uh, the, in the cross examination, <coughs> neither of the parties can ask the child directly. They have to give the question to the, to the judge. And the judge formulates the question for the child. Yeah? He, the judge does not alter, does not make a different question out of it. This is not his right. But he says it in a child-friendly way, if he is trained, uh, and says it in a non-offensive way. And therefore, the offense and the uh, how to say the, 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 the aim of the, of the defense lawyer to break the child is not uh, achieved because 
the judges there to protect. And it's also a possibility in an adversarial system because the judge only gives the, the question of the party, does not give an, a question of his or her own. So it's not uh, uh, against the, uh, the adversarial system at all. And that has proven very, very important and very, very helpful to keep a child quiet. Furthermore, there is in almost all uh, uh, procedural codes uh, concerning uh, regulations of, uh, of uh, uh, cross-examination. One paragraph, I do not know in our code, sorry, in the code of Georgia if we have it, uh, that uh, the judge has the possibility not to allow a question that has already been posed once. So in the case of that girl, the judge allowed eight lawyers to ask the same question and eight, uh, eight men to ask it. This is possible also immediately. A well-trained judge, and it, he doesn't need to be, or she doesn't need to be specialized in children, will not allow uh, a lawyer to insist in the same question over and over and over again. And he, a, a good judge has the possibility immediately to cut if a lawyer tries to hamper the respect for a victim and witness. This is possible if you have a strong judge. Yes. Thank you very much. And this also brings us again to, uh, to what extent the judge has internalized the principle of the best interest of the child. This is extremely important. And also this uh, reminds me of, uh, since 1985 in the Beijing rules, there's a requirement that the judge has to explain the judgment, the decision to the, to the child, to the juvenile. Because the legal terms, the juvenile would not, would not uh, necessarily understand. So there's a requirement, an obligation to explain it in simple, in simple terms. Uh, any other question uh, to Justice Winter? Yes, please. Maybe this will be the last question. Please go ahead. Well, hello, everyone. I'm a judge from Albania. And actually, I don't have a question, but I had a comment on what was said now on the last question. Uh, we introduced in our legislation last year, so we, we approved a criminal justice code for juveniles. And what was introduced was the possibility for children that have been interrogated during preliminary investigation by uh, specialized people, like for example the psychologist or other, uh, other specialized people depending on the needs of the child, not to be interrogated again during the trial. So uh, if during the preliminary investigation the prosecutor is accurate enough to, uh, to guarantee the rights also to the defendant, and then it can be recorded or somehow it can be uh, reflected in, in some other way, and the judge during the trial considers that it is not appropriate for the child to be interrogated again, he or she can decide, so the judge can decide to uh, not to, to question the, the child again, based on the best interest of the child, of course, without uh, damaging the process. So this is another possibility. You have that, uh, that in almost each and every European uh, uh, legislation. I remember that because I was there when you did it. <laughs> yeah. OK, please. Hello, everyone. I am Judge uh, from Turkey. Uh, in Turkey, we have some regulations. Uh, we have actually two different centers. One is child monitoring center, and the other is judicial interview rooms. Uh, when a child is uh, victimized uh, because of sexual violence, uh, in the prosecution team, we investigate the, the prosecutors listen the child in the child monitoring centers. On that phase, uh, only the special uh, services like psychologists and uh, socialists speak with the child. Uh, they connected the prosecutor or a judge by a hear earphones and uh, the judge or prosecutor ask the question and also the lawyers and the uh, experts will change the uh, question due to the 
um, child special needs and the child give the answers and all the trials, um, courthouses or the prosecutors can watch that in interrogation in uh, his room. Uh, that's why we are trying to minimize the secondary vi victimization uh, and protect the uh, uh, victim's special needs and also the ju judicial interview rooms are um, can be used by the other victims, vulnerable groups of victims. Um, and this is after we made some seminars and education programs to the judges and prosecutors uh, to raise their awareness about this uh, room's function, we actually uh, observed the increasing number of usage of this, these rooms. So if you want to following, um, maybe it will be inspirational for your countries too. If you want to f uh, get following uh, details, you can check our website to uh, construction of these kinds of rooms. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very first four uh, such rooms, uh, special child-friendly investigation rooms, have been opened in this country uh, last month. Thank you very much for the questions. Okay, uh, please, please be very short because otherwise I will uh, I will not be fair to the other presenters also when we come to the discussion. Very very uh, brief. We please. go to the discussion. Then I will wait. <laughs> I, w I just wanted to remark Lithuania experience. In Lithuania, from the 1st of J July this year, we started also implemented the, the rooms. And uh, the difference is that in that rooms, uh, questions uh, provide to the children just psychologists. And they, they uh, reformulate the, the questions of the judge, of the prosecutor, and uh, pretrial investigation officer. And just psychologists uh, have contact with child, and in that situation, uh, the, the child is not victimized, and, and the, the, there is low problem. Okay, thank you for sharing this uh, important information. So now, thank you very much, uh, Justice Winter. And you are staying with us uh, for maybe, mo we, we, yeah, uh, five minutes. <laughs> thank you. Um, now we, we, we will have the third presentation with Mr. Irakli Shonia, Deputy Director of Legal Aid Service. Uh, Mr. Shonia is a lawyer with an intensive work experience and a certified trainer on juvenile justice. He has been effectively participating in specialization of justice professionals. He has been actively involved in the process of the implementation of juvenile justice system reforms and leads the process of development of child-friendly legal aid system in Georgia. Uh, Mr. Shonia started his professional career as a lawyer, consultant at Georgian Young Lawyers Association in 2004. In 2008, he joined the Legal Aid Service of the Ministry of Justice and served on different positions until 2012. Then, since 2014, he is a specialist, invited lecturer on practical skills at Tbilisi Ivani Javakshvili State University and invited specialist on legal ethics and practical skills of Guram Tavar Kiladze University. He has been serving as a deputy director of the legal aid of Georgia since 2014. He got promoted to this current position after being appointed as head of monitoring and analysis unit at the legal aid service in 2013. Please, over to you. Mogu salmo bit, čempiju zalijen didi pati vija, tukvenci naše Kawake to mohse ne bada vila para kwa sinu shinu sa git khebzi romili se khebara su tsuanta marsa jule bi sa git khebzi. Tumtsa tsota tsila tukta artuli roli kalba to yurina tas mohse ne bizga mos lushem dgum shilia chemi prezentaci arts tuise zansa interesu ikos magram merat kwa unda ara sa yata shori so samar tlibri kutkit gawa makhulip urad ribas me gawa makhulip urad ribas sa kartuelo shi ara su tsuanta marsa jule bi sistemi se reforma zeda am reformis ერთ-ერთ ნაწილზე იურიდული დახმარების სამსახურზე. და რა მიხცევები აქვს ზოგადად იურიდული დახმარების სამსახურს არა სუსტანდა მარსაჯულების კუთხით. მოიხსენებათ ეს ერთ-ერთი მნიშვნელოვანი საკითხია ჩვენთვის და ქვეყნისთვის და შეიძლება ითქვას რომ საქართველოში ბოლო დროს მარსაჯულების სისტემაში განხორციელებული რეფორმებში ერთ-ერთი საუკეთესო მიღწევაა რა სუსტანდა მარსაჯულების კოდექსი. საქართველოში 2015 წელს იქნა შემუშავებული არა სუსტანდა მარსაჯულების კოდექსი, რომელიც ძალა შევიდა 2016 წელს. 
და უნდა ითქვას რომ ეს რეფორმა საკმაოდ ასე ვთქვათ წარმატებით ხორციელდება და ამის ამ წარმატების საწინდარი არის რა თქმა უნდა პროფესიონალების სტორი მიდგომა გაიროს გაიროს ასე ვთქვათ როლი ასევე ქალბატონი რენატას როლი რომელიც ამ პროცესში იყო ჩართული თავიდან ბოლომდე როგორც ექსპერტი და ერთ-ერთი უძლიერესი ექსპერტია როგორც ჩვენი პანელისტი ასე ვთქვათ დამყურმა ახსენა და ფიქრობ რომ ეს რეფორმა მთლიანობაში ძალიან კარგად მიმდინარეობს ეხა მე ძალიან რო არ შეგაწყვიტოთ ამ ზოგადი საუბრებით უშუალოდ კონკრეტულად გადავალ თუ რა იყო საქართველოსი არასუსტონთა მარცაჯულების მიმართულებით კოდექსის ამოქმედებამდე. ანუ კოდექსი ამოქმედდა 2016 წლის 1 იანვარს და კოდექსის ამოქმედებამდე იურიდული დახმარების სამსახურში რა სერიუსებით შეეძლოთ ესარგებათ არასუწონი სხვადასხვა კატეგორიის არასუწონი სტატუსის კონე. 2016 წლის 1 იანვარამდე იურიდული დახმარება ხელმისაწვდომი იყო არასუწონი ბრალდებულებისთვის საქმის წარმოების ნებისმიერ ეტაპზე. არ ქონდა მნიშვნელობა მის სოციალურ სტატუსს იმიტომ რომ ეს ჩვენი კანონის თანახმად არის სავალდებულო დაცვის ელემენტი. ასევე უზრუნე ყოფილი იყო არასწორი დაზარალების წარმომადგენლობა და უფასოიურდული დახმარება მაგრამ ეს იყო შესაძლებელი ასე ვთქვათ გამოძიების პროცესში და ასევე იყო დაზარალებული არასუწოვანი ქმედ უნარო ან შეზღუდული ქმედ უნარიანი არასუწოვანი და მითითებული აქ 153 პრიმი 153 სექუნდა 153 ტერცია მუხლები რომელიც ეხება ასე ვთქვათ წამებას და არ ადამიანი მოყრობას და ასე შემდეგ მხოლოდ ამ მუხლებთან მიმართებაში იყო შესაძლებელი რომ არასუწოვანს ესახმება ესარგებათ უბასოიური დახმარების უფლებით თუმცა ეს სურათი ჩვენ რადიკალურად შეგვიცვალა მას შემდეგ რაც არასუწოვანთა მარცაჯულების კოდექსი შევიდა ძალაში 2016 წლის 1 იანვარს და ამით საკმაოდ გაფართოვდა ისფერო არასუწოვნების რომლებსაც შეუძლიათ უფასო იურიდული დახმარების სერვისებით ისარგებლონ საქართველოში ესე კანონთა კომპლექსში მყოფი არასუწოვანი 14 ან 18 წლამდე პირი ნებისმიერ პირს უფლება აქვს უფასო იურიდული დახმარების უფლებაზე ასევე ახალმა არასუწოვანთა მარცაჯულების კოდექსმა საშუალება მიიცა 18 იდან 21 წლამდე პირებსაც რომ ისარგებლონ უფასო იურიდული დახმარების უფლებით. თუმცა ეს არ არის სავალდებულო დაცვის კომპონენტი, ეს არის უფლება და ამ უფლების რეალიზება დამოკიდებულია თავად არასუწოვანზე 18 იდან 21 წლამდე პირზე. ანუ მას უნდა შეეთავაზოს შესაბამის პროფესიონალიზმის ხიდან, რომ არის ასეთი საშუალება და მისი სურული შემთხვევაში უფასო წარმომადგენლობას ახორციელებს იურიდული დახმარების სამსახური. ასევე მნიშვნელოვანია რომ ადრე ძველი კოდექსის მოქმედების სფეროში არ იყო ასე ვთქვათ მოწმეების სავალდებულო წარმომადგენლობა და არასუწოვანთა მარცაჯულების კოდექსში ცვლილებების განხორციელების შედეგად 2000 უფრო სწორედ მას შემდეგ რაც არასუწოვანთა მარცაჯულების კოდექსი ძალაში შევიდა 2016 წლიდან შესაძლებელი გახდა არასუწოვანი მოწმეების უფასო იურიდული დახმარება მხოლოდ შემოტანილი იქნა კრიტერიუმი გადახდის უნარობის ანუ გადახდის უნარობა არის ჩვენთა მთავრობის დადგენილებით დადგენილი რაც ნიშნავს იმას რომ ყველა პირს რომელსაც გააჩნია 70000 ქულა ტოლია 70000 ქულა და ნაკლები უფლება აქვს მიიღოს უფასო იურიდული დახმარება შესაბამისად ეს კრიტერიუმი გავრცელდა მხოლოდ მოწმეებზე და მოწმეებს უფლება აქვთ თუ არიან გადახდის უნაროები ისარგებლონ ასევე უფასო იურიდული დახმარების უფლებით თუმცა ამ მიმართულებით კოდექსში განხორციელდა ცვლილებები რომელიც შედის ამ წლის ბოლოს ანუ 2018 წლის 1 იანვარიდან ცვლილებების შედეგად მივიღეთ შემდგომი რომ გარკვეული კატეგორიის მუხლებზე მიუხედავად პირი სოციალური სტატუსის ანუ არასრულწლოვანი სოციალური სტატუსისა მათ შეეძლებათ მიიღონ უფასო იურიდული დახმარება რა კატეგორიის საკითხებია ეს ესე იგი ეს არის სისხლის სამართლის უფროსო სისხლის სამართლის კოდექსის 19 14 და 22 თავით გათვალისწინებული დანაშაულები ეს არის დანაშაულები სიცოცხლის წინააღმდეგ ეს არის დანაშაული ჯამთელობის წინააღმდეგ და ეს არის დანაშაული სქესობრივი თავისუფლებისა და ხელშეუხლებლობის წინააღმდეგ სწორედაც ამ კატეგორიის დანაშაულებზე არასრულწლოვან მოწმეებს მიუხედავად მათი გადახდის უნარობისა და მათი სოციალური სტატუსისა უფლება აქვთ მიიღონ უფასო იურიდული დახმარება. 
შეიძლება ეს არ არის, მაინც და მაინც თლიანობაში შესაბამისობაში საერთაშორისო სტანდარტებთან ასეთი რეგულაციის შემოღება, მაგრამ სახელმწიფო იღებს პოზიტიურ ვალდებულებას, რომ ეტაპობრივად ნაბიჯ ნაბიჯ გადავიდეთ. იქამდე რომ ყველა მოწმის უფლება, ასევე მიუხედავად რა კატეგორიის საქმე იხილება, იქნეს უზრუნველყოფილი. თუმცა ამ ეტაპზე არის ეს სინამდვილე რაც გვაქ. ასევე არას უწოვემ შეუძლიათ მიიღონ უფასიურდული დახმარება პატიმრობის კოდექსით გათვალისწინებული დისციპლინური სამართალ წარმოებისას და ეს არის ორი შემთხვევა, როდესაც ხდება დისციპლინური სამართალ წარმოება და ხდება არას უწონის სამართლო საკანში ან საგნის ტიპის დაწესებულებაში გადაყვანა, ამ შემთხვევაშიც უფასიურდული მომსახურება არის უზრუნველყოფილი. ასევე არას უწონ და მართაჯულების კოდექსმა გაითვალისწინა და არას უწონ და მართაჯულების კოდექსი არეგულირებს როგორც სისხლ სამართლი მიმართულებას, ასევე ადმინისტრაციულ სამართალდარღვეთა კოდექსით გათვალისწინებულ საკითხებს და ყოველ არას უწონს რომელიც შეიძლება სავარაუდოდ ითვლებოდეს ადმინისტრაციულ სამართალდარღვევად და თუ ეს ადმინისტრაციულ სამართალდარღვევის კონკრეტული მუხლი ითვალისწინებს პატიმრობას მას უფლება აქვს მიიღოს უფასო იურიდიული დახმარება ამ ადმინისტრაციულ სამართალ წარმოების პროცესში. თუმცა აქვე მინდა აღნიშნო, რომ ეგ არის კრიტერიუმი, ასე ვთქვათ, პატიმრობის კრიტერიუმი, რომელსაც ადმინისტრაციულ სამართალ წარმოების კოდექსი ითვალისწინებს, სადაც ენიშნება ადვოკატს ადვოკატი. თუმცა ზოგადად არასრულწლოვნის მიმართ პატიმრობა ადმინისტრაციულ სამართალ წარმოების საკითხებზე არ ხდება და არ გამოიყენება, მაგრამ კოდექსში არის შეანაწერი რომ ის მუხლები, რომლებიც ზოგადად ითვალისწინებს პატიმრობას, თუ ამ მუხლებთან დაკავშირებით ასევე არის ალტერნატიული სანქციები, ჯარიმები და ასე შემდეგ, მიუხედავად ამისა, შეუძლიათ არასრულწლოვნმა მიიღონ უფასო იურიდიული მომსახურება. აა, ხედავ რაღაც მე მგონი ცოტა დროში ვერ ვეტევი, ამიტომ მომიწევს ცოტა ჩქარა საუბარი. იურ დახმარების სამსახურის ადვოკატების სპეციალიზაცია. რაც შეეხება სპეციალიზაციას, სპეციალიზაცია არის ერთ-ერთი მნიშვნელოვანი საკითხი და იურიდიული დახმარების სამსახურში სპეციალიზაციის საკითხი დაიწყო 2014 წელს ჯერ კიდე არასუწონთა მართაჯულების კოდექსის მიღებამდე და ეს პროცესი განხორციელდა ევროკავშირისა და გაეროს ბავშთა ფონდის აქტიური თანამშრომლობით და დახმარებით. 2014 წელს სამსახურში გადამზადდა 20 სპეციალიზებული ადვოკატი ჯერ კიდე სპეციალიზაცია კანონის დონეზე არ მოგეთხოვებოდა, მაგრამ მიუხედავად ამისა გავაკეთეთ ეს, რომლებიც და მხოლოდ არასუწონთა კატეგორიის საქმეების წარმოება ხორციელდებოდა ამ სპეციალიზებული ადვოკატების მეშვეობით. თუმცა 2014 წელს შემუშავდა და ასევე 2014 წელს შემუშავდა და დამტკიც და გარკვეული კრიტერიუმები თუ როგორ უნდა მომხდარი იყო ამ არასუწონთა საკითხებზე სპეციალიზებული ადვოკატების შერჩევა, ეს კომპონენტები მოიცავდა ასე ვთქვათ სამოტივაციო წერილს, ზეპირგასაუბრებას, შემდგომ წინასწარ დამტკიცებული მოდულის მიხედვით ტრენინგის გავლას და სპეციალიზაციის მინიჭებას რაშიც ასევე აქტიურად იყვნენ ჩართული არასამთავრობო და საერთაშორისო ორგანიზაციების წარმომადგენლები. მას შემდეგ რაც 2015 წელს მიღებული იქნა არასუწონთა მართაჯულების კოდექსი, ჯერ კიდე ის ძალაში არ იყო შესული, მაგრამ სახელმწიფო უწყებებს და სხვა სხვა უწყებებს, მათ შორის როგორც სახელმწიფო ისე არა არა სახელმწიფო უწყებებს დაევალათ გარკვეული მოსამზადებელი სამუშაოების ჩატარება მანამ სამ არასუწონთა მართაჯულების კოდექსი შევიდოდა ძალაში და ეს იყო სპეციალიზაციის საკითხი. ანუ 2015 წელს იურიდიული დახმარების სამსახურში დავიწყეთ სპეციალიზაციის საკითხი, სპეციალიზაცია ანუ ადვოკატების გადამზადება, სპეციალიზება და 2014 წელს უკვე სპეციალიზებულ 20 ადვოკატის რიცხვი, 20 ადვოკატის რიცხვი შეიძლება ითქვას რომ გაიზარდა 2 3ჯერ. ვინაიდან უკვე მოლოდინი დაატვირთვის მომართვიანობის იყო დიდი და სწორედ და ეს იყო საფუძველი რომ იურიდიული დახმარების სამსახურში სპეციალიზებული ადვოკატთა რიცხვი გაგვეზარდა. ფიქრობ სპეციალიზაცია არასუწონთა მართაჯულების საკითხებში არის ერთ-ერთი მნიშვნელოვანი საკითხი, იმიტომ რომ მოგეხსენებათ ყველაფერი შეიძლება ვერ დარეგულირდეს კოდექსით და სწორედაც რომ ბავშვის საუკეთესო ინტერესების დასაცავად აუცილებელია რომ ყველა პროფესიონალი რომელიც ამ პროცესში არის ჩართული, გულისყურით ეკიდებოდეს არასუწონთა მართებაში მიდგომებს, იცადოს იმ სტანდარტებს და ზოგადად ფიქრობ რომ მიდგომა როდესაც საუბრობ ჩვენ საერთაშორისო ინსტრუმენტებზე, დოკუმენტებზე და მათ კლასიფიკაციას ვაკეთებთ როგორც ასე ვთქვათ სავარდებ ხასიათის დოკუმენტები, როგორც სარეკომენდაციო ხასიათის დოკუმენტები, იმ შემთხვევაში თუ პროცესი შართული პირი არის სპეციალიზებული, მიმაჩნია რომ ყველა დოკუმენტი, მიუხედავად იმისა ის არის სარეკომენდაციო ხასიათის თუ სავალდებულო ხასიათის, შეიძლება ვაქციულ სავალდებულო ხასიათის დოკუმენტად, ვინაიდან ყველა პროფესიონალმა, რომელიც არის სპეციალიზებული ამ დარგში, ნებისმიერ დოკუმენტი, რომელიც ეხება და აწესრიგებს არასუწონთა უფლებებს, 
სადაც უკეთესად არის ეს ნორმა და ეს უფლება მოწესრიგებული შეუძლია ასე თქვა განსაკუთრებით მოსამართლეს და საფუძველს და გავიდეს ამ დოკუმენტზე და ისე მიიღოს ესა თუ ის გადაწყვეტილება. საქართველოს შეარასტოვანთა მარსაჯულების კოდექსის ეფექტური იმპლემენტაციის მიზნით შეიქმნა ასე თქვა უწყებათა შორის საკოორდინაციო საბჭო იუსტიციის სამინისტროში და ასევე შეიქმნა ეს იყო ცენტრალურ დონეზე და ასევე იყო რეგიონალურ უწყებათა შორის საკოორდინაციო საბჭოები რომელიც ასე თქვა იყო შექმნილი გაეროს ბავშთა ფონდის აქტიური ძალის ხმები და იუსტიციის სამინისტროსი ევროკავშირის რომელმაც საკმაოდ დიდი როლი შეასრულა საქართველოსში მიღებული არასუსტანდა მარსაჯულების კოდექსის იმპლემენტაციის კუთხით და ასე თქვა ერთგვაროვანი მიდგომების ასე თქვა უზრუნველ საყოფად და ინტერესების დასახლებულად რომლებიც რომელიც აიღო ძალიან მნიშვნელოვანი ამ პროცესში იმიტომ რომ მოიხსენებათ ახალი იყო კოდექსი და იყო გარსკვავებული ინტერპრეტაციები გარკვეული ნორმების და ეს აუცილებლად საჭიროებდა სწორი მიმართულების სწორი კალაპოტით ასე თქვა განვითარებას და ამას ძალიან დიდად შეუწყო ხელი ამ მულტიდისციპლინარულ ჯგუფებმა სადაც ყველა ის იმ ორგანიზაციის წარმომადგენელი იყო ჩართული რომელსაც რაიმე ფორმით ჰქონდა არასუწონთან შეხება სადაც ხდებოდა ურთიერთთა გაცვლა პრობლემური საკითხების წამოწევა და ხდებოდა გადაწყვეტილების მიღება თუ მომავალში მანამ სანამ კანონში ცვლილებები განხორციელდებოდა როგორ დაგვეცვა როგორ უზრუნველყო ეს საკითხები ამ პროცესში ამ მოტოდისპლინარულ სამუშაო ჯგუფების მუშაობის დროს შეგვებდა უამრავი ინფორმაცია, პრობლემური საკითხები, პრობლემური ნორმები, რომელიც შემდგომ განზოგადდა და 2018 წელს ეს ასე ვთქვათ იქცა საკანონმდებლო ცვლილებებად, რომელიც იქნა ასე ვთქვათ არასუსტო მარსაჯულების კოდექსი შესული და რომელიც ამოქმედება რიგი უკვე ამოქმედდა და როზოგი მადგანი ამოქმედდა 2019 წლის პირველი იანვრიდან. ასევე გაეროს ბავშთა ფონდის აქტიური ძალისხმევით შემუშავდა ბავშზე მორგებულ გარემოზე სივრცეზე არსებული ტექნიკის საშუალებების გამოყენების მარეგულირებელი აქტები მე მახსოვს ფონდის მიერ ჩამოყვანილი იყო ექსპერტი რომელმა შეიმუშავა ასე თქვა კონცეფცია თუ როგორ უნდა ყოფილიყო ბავშზე მორგებული გარემოს სივრცე მოწყობილი სხვადასხვა უწყებებში შემუშავდა ეს კონცეფცია და ამის შემდგომ რამოდენიმე უწყებაში მოხდა ბავშზე მორგებული სივრცის ასე თქვა მოწყობა ასევე ვის აქტიური მხარდაჭერით. ეხამე მინდა შევეხო მოკლედ კოდექსის ამოქმედების შემდგომ განხორციელებულ ასე თქვა აქტივობებს. UNICEF-ის ინიციატივით და მხარდაჭერით მარსაჯულების სისტემაში ბავშვებთან დაკავშირებულ მონაცემთა ერთიანი სისტემის გაცვლის მიზნით შემუშავდა კონცეფცია. შემუშავდა კონცეფცია, სადაც ყველა უწყება, რომელიც ამ ფორმით არის შე ასე თქვა ჩართული არასუსტო მარსაჯულების პროცესში, შექმნის ისეთ სისტემას, სადაც მოხდება სტატისტიკური ინფორმაციის გაცვლა. და ეს სტატისტიკური ინფორმაცია თავს მოიყრის ერთ უწყებაში და შემდგომ ეს უწყება იქნება პასუხისმგებელი ამ სტატისტიკური ინფორმაციის განზოგადოებაზე და მის გამოყენებაზე. მოიხსენება სტატისტიკის ანალიზი, ზოგად არის ძალიან მნიშვნელოვანი იმისთვის, რომ მომავალში გარკვეული, ასე თქვა, ნაბიჯები დაიგეგმოს, რათა უკეთ იყოს უზრუნველყოფილი ბავშვის საუკეთესო ინტერესები და ყურადღება გამახვილდეს პრევენციულ მექანიზმზე და ასე შემდეგ. 2017 წელს სამსახურმა და გაეროს ბავშვთა ფონდთან ურთიერთა ამშრომის საფუძველზე, ასე თქვა, იმუშავა ა არასუწონთა კატეგორიის საქმეებზე ხარისხის შეფასების სისტემაზე მოგესმება სამსახურში გუში მქონდა პრეზენტაცია პილოტირება ხდებოდა ხარისხის შეფასების სისტემის ეს დოკუმენტი საბოლო ძალაში არაა შესული იმიტომ რომ ჯერ კიდევ აქ მიმდინარეობს ამაზე დისკუსია და ვაპირებთ ამ დოკუმენტის იმპლემენტაციას ვაპირ Sorry, immediately there's still one presentation. It's, it's, everybody has to be there in order for us to adopt the outcome document. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, give us, give us like 10 minutes maximum. No? Okay. 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 Thank you. So, Mr. Irakli, can you, in 30 seconds, wrap up so okay. Mr. Ghadamfar okay. can give us a few minutes? Sorry, this is, I mean, beyond our control. We have to... We have to, to, to go. Unless you vote to stay here and not to go to the big plenary session, then let me know. <laughs> okay, please, okay. 30 seconds. Uh, situation, I'm going to say, 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 I
Trozi adri da onta rogor swat kubes prezentacija. Erti si kuit. Shay shay umushavet. Kriteri umi bi romlis mikhe da sunda mokte skaris kishe pase ba rasu tonda kategori sak mebze gat zol mom sakure obis da opikrob tan dokumente simplementacija srat kon da iz dokumente aris cerki de samusha oversia tumca aris kola neirat amzad imistuis rom shem gomshi iz dokumente mokt am dokumente simplementi reba mokte sim tli an koncepti is nazilat da mokte sam dokumente is amukmedeba. Asebe minda gawa makhulu qurat gebarom. Mr. Zakari, please just wrap it up. Please give us the conclusion. Okay. Tlianobashi, Shale by it was from Arasutan, the Marsa Julebis system is reformed, Armatavit Mundinops, Udul Dahmer Samsahurshi, Taminda Gaumahu, Ura Dribaromilis Guaxia, Hahan Yul, Rustavis, Udul Dahmer, Biro, Shigaista, Babs and Murgebuli Silse, Kalbaton Marena, Arsena, Babshi specialized Buliotakis, Asuna Mortis Daget, his procedure, Bidazalian Nishno, one year Rom, is as it was. میدگمه بی که اول اوت که به مگایت والی استون دم مختص عراسوتونی ساوقت سو اینترنت بیس از نو ساقوبا دام قلا پریز گام کنه با. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So now we we have to go very quickly to the last presenter, Mr. Radanfar Kamanji, who is a practicing lawyer and the legal director of the International Legal Foundation West Bank. Uh, Mr. Kamanji works with lawyers to develop their legal abilities, helps them conduct legal research, and build small focus groups within the offices to work on various legal matters. Mr. Irakli, thank you very much, and sorry for this, which is beyond uh, my control. Please, uh, you have not more than five minutes. Also, apologies, but um, I mean, sometimes uh, uh, it okay, happens. Please, go ahead. It's like going harder and harder, and this is what I call mission impossible. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you for your introduction. What I am, I have talked today, it's about the juvenile system, justice system in Palestine. And also I'm gonna talk uh, about the, the program which we called Comprehensive Representation for Juvenile. Okay, let me talk a little bit how we worked before and how the system worked before with uh, the juveniles. It's like in uh, 1954, it was about the rehabilitation juvenile law, 1954. Okay, it was like there is a lot of like some, a lot of things or bad things for the juvenile. Some of them, it's uh, the age of a crim uh, criminal responsibility. It was just nine years. So the court and the, the prosecution, they can accuse and trial the juvenile during, like while he wa is uh, nine years. Also, uh, about the banishment, according to this law, it was like the imprisonment and also the like uh, imposing fine. It's like such a banishment acceptable for the juvenile. Detention, it was a rule. <laughs> okay, and uh, the exception is to release uh, the juvenile. It, at that time, it was like without like it's no. I want to take a photo with you. <laughs> okay. At that time, there is no specialized. <laughs> there is no specialized court at that time, and let me quickly talking about like the principles. Okay, the principles how we can deal with the juveniles. Uh, the, uh, okay, we we bought some theory institutional theory for uh, juvenile representation, protection of the juvenile, and eliminating uh, them from going back to the court. It was like the priority, and the, the key to achieving this priority is just to let them don't go back to the court. Okay. Uh, it was so complicated when we raised that the, uh, this justice system is really like harm all of the uh, juveniles. And also to keep him, uh, them in the jail, it's let them go back and it's of uh, effect their psychology. What we did, we in ILF West Bank, we developed the juvenile justice system. We created a knowledge base. We training our attorneys, uh, and we held like round tables and workshops with the juvenile partners and the stakeholders. 
we have like brought and still bringing international fellows. We uh, develop a case map, this case map which talk about the steps of the case for the juvenile. It's about the procedures, uh, procedures and all of the uh, stakeholders who took a decision during the life of the case. Then we bought like a logic model. As you see, it's like complicated. I will not go over all of the, uh, this like logic model, but it's talk about like four things. It's about the objective, activities, and results, and also evaluations. And all of them, it's, it's one line. So any one of them like out of this line, that means there is something wrong. We have to go back and see where is the wrong. OK. Uh, there is a saying, say, that, uh, that it needs a village to raise a child. So there is a lot, like all of us, we have a role to, like, to protect the child and to protect the juvenile. And our role as a defense attorney, at least in our program, we are working to uh, communication with all of the stakeholders and with all of the partners, just like, and even the complainant, just to get a mediation. And with this mediation, we dismissed all of the case. Even if we didn't like success in this mediation, we have like to create a unique arguments just to convince the court to take the alternative measure which like best for best interest for the juvenile. So we have to keep, as my colleague said before, best interest of the child all the time as a defense theory. Okay. Where we are now, uh, we are now like uh, the beginning of the age of responsibility. It's, it was like nine years, now it's 12 years. Punishment, there's, there was like punishment. Now we have alternative uh, measures. And also detention, it was the rule, now it's the exception. Uh, there is no specialized court at the, uh, before. Now we have a specialized, co a specialized court, specialized prosecution, specialized uh, uh, police. Uh, also about the, uh, the appeal, we, uh, at that time there is no cassation court. Now we have cassation court, early access. Now we have early access for the juvenile at that time. And every case there is representation for the juvenile. Okay, at the end I want to say, okay, uh, uh, injustice anywhere, that means it's the three thin justice everywhere, according to what Martin Luther said before. So I think if we put our hands with each other, that means we have to improve one child, that means we can save all of the world and achieve seeking justice for the juveniles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Khadanfar, and also I highly appreciate your ability to summarize. Thank you. Apologies from the three presenters because there won't be time for questions, but uh, I highly encourage you if there is a coffee break or any opportunity to discuss with them on a one one-on-one basis. Uh, thank you very much, and please you can uh, go to the plenary session now.